Thank you very much, uh, dear Chair, Minister, Nora. Uh, it's a great, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, um, it's a great pleasure for me to be here uh, today, back on the Emerald Island, and uh, um, to talk about a subject which uh, probably, uh, as Nora has already said, uh, um, has been occupying you most next to the Brexit. Uh, to which I will not uh, say anything um, today, because basically uh, it is for us at the moment business as usual. We are a union of 28 member states, and the rights and obligations continue to exist. Uh, and anything else, we will have to see. So I've been asked today to talk to you about uh, uh, migration and the European Union policy in the area of migration. And I start off, and this has a read across to what I was just saying, um, first of all by saying that when we talk about migration in the European Union, we talk about third country nationals, not EU nationals. Uh, we talk about third country nationals arriving in the European Union and dealing with uh, uh, these third country nationals. And migration, as we all know, is one of the challenges of globalization. If you look at the latest figures uh, published by UNHCR, um, 65 million who are at the moment either refugees or, in, or internally displaced people in the world. And uh, we are witnessing some of that, obviously, also in Europe. When President Juncker campaigned to become president of the European Commission, he actually gave a very uh, forward-looking speech in May 2014, where he, in Malta, where he said, one of my major issues that I will try and uh, confront when I, if I were to become Commission President, will be migration. Something which uh, I can say to you, we have over the last years, to a certain extent, not dared to touch because it was such a hot potato, uh, whereas he actually campaigned on it. And it was one of his 10 policy subject areas where he thought the Commission should engage while stopping a lot of other issues. So you know the overall saying, uh, big on big things and small on small things. President Juncker clearly thought migration was a big thing. And when he became Commission President, uh, this was part of the um, agenda that he put forward, also when he was elected by the European Parliament. And you find this also in the strategic agenda of the European Council. Migration has moved on the top of the issue of uh, um, uh, the Commission. I have only since two years now had the responsibility of dealing with these issues. And when I took over, I it was still under the, in the old commission, uh, people were saying to me, uh, look here, you're getting a nice job. This is not going to be that uh, uh, politically relevant. You can, uh, before retirement, uh, do a bit of international negotiations and otherwise uh, uh, live um, through a nice uh, few years uh, in, a, in, a, in a cozy job. I can tell you, I have been witnessing in the last 24 months the perfect storm uh, where, in reality, a lot of our policies were blown away, away where I had to realized that we had been building together as a European Union villages of Potemkin, agencies which perhaps could work in fair weather 
conditions, but which were clearly not built to master the type of policies that uh, our politicians, uh, but also our citizens, were asking from us. Uh, and this became very clear uh, already towards uh, the end of the year of uh, 2014, and clearly when things evolved uh, in 2015. Um, we, were, we had a first discussion on the European migration agenda at the level of the college in January of 2015. Uh, we defined the different pillars uh, on which we were going to work. There was a very strong focus on legal migration at the time, demography and legal migration. Um, and then the horrible accident of the ship in the central Mediterranean happened with 900 people drowning in April. I remember it was 19th, I think 18th or 19th of April of 2015, where we then uh, suddenly everybody turned around and said, what is Europe doing in terms of letting these people drown? And so at the beginning, the major emphasis and the major focus of public opinion but also of our politicians, was on how do we manage to save lives. And uh, this was the major issue which, uh, to a certain extent, we had to tackle with. Uh, in April, we had a European Council, we had the tripling of the, uh, the monies available, we had uh, ships mobilized, uh, and uh, also Ireland uh, is contributing with uh, a ship called, I don't know how to pronounce it, Lee Orzin, Orzin? Orzin. Orzin. Lee Orzin. 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 Uh, which has just recently saved uh, over 300 uh, migrants. So uh, this was the first focus. But then all the people saved in the central Mediterranean route, what happens with them? They're not taken back to Libya. They are taken back to one of our member states, in this case, most of the time, Italy, not Malta, Lampedusa, and other places. And then the overall question was very quickly asked, should all these people be taken care of by the one member state that has actually given them <laughs> haven? And which is why, uh, we then worked through a number of um, uh, emergency measures, which we proposed in May uh, and later, and I will go into them in little detail. And at the same time, we proposed a European uh, agenda on migration, which was actually structured uh, along four pillars. And I'll say a little bit about these pillars to you. But I think the first thing to understand about the European agenda on migration is you cannot run a European agenda on migration just from an inward-looking perspective. If you want to deal with migration, you have to start with a country of origin. You have to look at policies in terms of country of transit, whether they're outside the European Union or inside the European Union. And then you also have to look at the policies in as much as the country of uh, then destination is, is concerned. And so a lot of things I will be saying now, you always have to keep in mind that uh, you, know, you can cut it this way, but at the same time you also have to think about uh, uh, make, uh, the whole transversal aspect. The four pillars in the European agenda on migration I uh, basically decline, decline them along sort of headline messages. Protect, protect, two pillars, one pillar protect, second pillar protect. The third pillar is manage and cooperate. And the fourth pillar is attract. And I'll go into these different uh, pillars. The first pillar, protect, is the protection 
of those who are in need of protection. Asylum and uh, uh, overall international uh, protection, uh, subsidiary protection, um, where we have, um, to a certain extent, and I'm sorry to say this in Dublin, because the system has been labeled the Dublin system, we have conceived a system which never worked and was never applied. Because it was a system which, to a certain extent, uh, was built on the principle that the country, the first country of arrival, would be the country which would actually be processing asylum requests. Yes, it worked to a certain extent, but then at the same time there was also the idea that those people who would move on would be sent back to the country or first country of arrival. This was considered to be too cumbersome, too complicated, never really implemented. Um, and uh, to a certain extent, uh, we have gone through different permutations and are now at uh, a version mark X, not to say the four word. <laughs> uh, we, Dublin four. Dublin four. <laughs> 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 um, well, basically, uh, we say we have to rework completely our European refugee protection and asylum system, um, which starts off uh, by saying, okay, well, let's keep, let's preserve the good idea of Dublin, which is first country should deal with asylum processes, but when a certain threshold is reached, we have proposed 150%, so every asylum seeker in the European Union would actually be rec would actually be registered. When a certain threshold, and I know that I'm talking here about a general proposal, an island can opt in to this or not, the, this is a decision which uh, will be taken later, if ever we, we end up in terms of the negotiations. But if, if, if you get to the threshold of 150%, you would actually um, then be able to trigger the help of the other member states. So that's uh, the new Dublin system, which has to go hand in hand with different rules on asylum procedures. So we are proposing in the next 10 days uh, an asylum procedures regulation. Different rules in as much as reception conditions are concerned. So we will be proposing a directive, a, a rework of the uh, reception conditions directive. Different rules in as much as qualifications are concerned. Uh, so we will be proposing a qualifications regulation and different rules in as much as registration. And we have already produ produced uh, a proposal on the, a new Eurodac system, which is the fingerprinting uh, system for asylum seekers, and a totally new rule for what is at the moment called the Asylum uh, Support Agency in Malta, and which will be called the EU Asylum Agency, uh, which will take a larger role in terms also of being able to mobilize capacities for what we would call joint processing. Just take the example of the Greek asylum system, which basically doesn't have enough people to process asylum requests in Greece, so we would be able to mobilize uh, uh, on a European Union level uh, experts uh, to help the Greek authorities. So that's the first pillar, and I have only 20 minutes, so I'll, I'll be more quick on the other ones. Second pillar, protect in terms of our external frontiers. So a shared responsibility for managing our external frontiers with uh, a total rework of uh, what you know under the title Frontex Agency, which will basically uh, have different operations, but also will be staffed with about 1,000 people. We'll have a reserve of uh, European border guard officers for different functions of another 1,500 people which can be mobilized. 
um, a kind of stress test approach to external border guarding, which would be the agency actually looking at whether a member state is capable of guarding its own borders. If that's the case, fine, Not, nothing needs doing. But if it's not the case, the agency would make recommendations and then a complicated process in terms of uh, um, deciding uh, whether then certain things need doing, uh, which can go in the end, again, this doesn't concern Ireland, uh, to a situation where a member state refuses to deploy other border guard officers uh, uh, on its external territory, but would then potentially no longer be part of the Schengen zone. So uh, this is uh, an agreement which we have just reached a few days ago uh, in negotiations with, uh, 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 between Council and the European Parliament. Again, I hasten to add, this is more a general description, but this is the, the, the second pillar. The third pillar, cooperate and manage, uh, is clearly, the, perhaps on the, on the second pillar, I, I need to say two words again about the hotspots. In reality, the European Commission, as is its normal role, has proposed legislation, was providing money. Suddenly, we were sucked in the last 12 months into actually trying to mobilize operations, you know, uh, in terms of helping member states on the ground how to deal with migratory flows. The setting up of hotspots, something which you know, essentially should be member states' business, but in the end we, we have been, been pushed into being there because there was always the question, what is Europe doing, what is Europe doing? Um, and so both on the Greek islands but also in Italy we have set up hotspots teams, also with second-line security defense in terms of uh, doing vetting in as much as uh, potential infiltration by terrorists are concerned. All these things uh, need to be organized, and we are pushed into um, uh, something which uh, I, as a sort of constitutional lawyer who believes in the subsidiarity principle, would, uh, would love to have avoided. But at the same time, there was... Uh, was uh, a, a, a very strong political push on that. The third pillar, manage and cooperate. This is essentially uh, return operations. It is essentially cooperating with third countries. It is readmission agreements. Uh, it is dealing with irregular migration. Because if we want to have the capacity to protect those people who are really in need of protection, we also need to be able to very quickly process those who should be coming to the European Union if they want to come to the European Union through legal routes of migration and not through irregular routes of migration. And uh, so this is the third pillar. The fourth pillar, attract the counter side to the return operations is building up legal migration. We have uh, revised the blue card scheme, just a few weeks ago, we put a new pro proposal on the table, which gives a much more common approach to attracting skilled labor to the European Union. Uh, we are reworking the whole acquis, uh, so all the legislative bases on the European Union level uh, in a refit uh, program in order to see uh, what can be, should be done and in full respect of the capacity of each member state to decide who and how many people should be coming. Uh, I still think that at some stage it would be good to have a system in, in place in Europe that people talk about as they talk about the Australian or the Canadian system. Uh, the Canadian system, I was just in Canada a few, a few days ago, uh, is one which also allows the provinces actually to set exactly the type of numbers they want to attract. Um, so we would, to a certain extent, be trying to create a kind of pool 
uh, a European pool also for legal migration. A second part of legal migration, which is linked to the protection of refugees, is resettlement, which is where we actually try and uh, attract uh, or, or give, not attract, but give places to those in need of protection so that they do not actually have to try the rather perilous journey through the Mediterranean uh, by providing additional places in terms of resettlement in the European Union. We have, uh, in the last year, decided that some 160,000 places should be available for relocation, some 20,000 only for uh, resettlement. <laughs> We're using some of the relocation places now for the resettlement scheme with with Turkey, the 54,000 which were reserved for Hungary, uh, we would be using in the context of, um, of the resettlement scheme with Turkey. Chair, I've been talking too long. I'm at about so one third of what I was going to say, but I think it'll be much more interesting that we have questions and then I will answer them and bring the rest of the stuff in there. Thank you very much for your attention.